Welcome to River Tales. River Tales is a 30-minute program that will introduce you to fascinating people, take you to interesting places, and enlighten you on important events that happen in our region. River Tales is sponsored by Southeast Missouri Hospital. On this edition of River Tales, we're geared up for the summer with superheroes, a treasured timepiece, slippery slides, and special events. Cape Girardeau hosted a Comic-Con convention that drew artists, collectors, and pop culture enthusiasts from all over the country. The bells of Academic Hall on Southeast campus have been ringing for more than 40 years. We give you a look behind the scenes of how things really work. The city of Cape Girardeau is making a big splash with their new water park. We'll take a trip to the thriving Cape County Cowboy Church. Stay tuned to River Tales. At Southeast Missouri Hospital, our cancer program is one of only 25% in the country accredited by the American College of Surgeons. That means I'm still here to tuck my kids in at night. We were the first hospital in the region to provide stereotactic radiation therapy. That means my dream of starting a business is still going strong. We're opening a patient-centered, state-of-the-art regional cancer center in 2010. That means I'll be here for my family for a long time. Why do the people of Southeast Missouri Hospital work so hard to be leaders in breast cancer care? Because of what it means to the people who come from outside our hospital. Visit Southeast Missouri Hospital on the web or call our health line. Understand your risks for breast cancer and see what makes us the region's most trusted source for cancer care. Originally showcasing comic books, Comic-Con has taken a life of highlighting science fiction characters in television and film, collectors of toys, games, trading cards, animation programming, and of course, comic books. Ken Murphy, owner of Marvels and Legends Comic Shop, created this local convention and has plans for bigger and better events in the future. comics and collectibles for 13 years. At the 10 year anniversary mark, I decided I wanted to do a trade show, a convention for fans to get together and, 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 and buy collectibles and buy hard to find items. But we also wanted to get creative people, writers and artists in the comic book community together um, and, and, and do tutorials and, and workshops and show their work. So we kind of wanted to, to create a, uh, an environment for convention goers and fans alike for Cape Comic Con. We're really lucky to have the creator of Ghost Rider, Gary Frederick, here. He's been a staple for our show, and the fans really love uh, Gary. Um, this year, DC Comics superstar artist Ethan Van Skyver, who was responsible for bringing back the Silver Age flashing Green Lantern, he's here this year. So we finally feel like we have a tremendous working artist who can share his talents and knowledge with the community. Um, we've got an author named D.L. Moore, who's done his third book in the series. Um, He's here this year, along with some professional artists from the Paducah area. So we've got some tremendous presence in the art community here at Cape Comic Con. DC Comics um, sees a little bit further than, than I do, uh, and then the artists usually do. And even though, say, I may want to draw something like Wonder Woman, they look at you and say, no, we think your style is more suited for Green Lantern or Flash or even Batman or Superman and they make those judgments and offer you projects in that way. So Green Lantern was a character that even though now I'm, I'm really associated with, with Green Lantern, I never liked him. I never read a Green Lantern book until I was given the assignment. And then I, I poured over all of the, uh, the back issues and thought, wow, this is really cool. There's something that can be done here. So. I've always liked, um, 
the 80s cartoon style. I mean, late 70s, early 80s, it's just something about that style, that, that full body, square jaw, you know, uh, full feel to it that really resonated with me. And that's, that's part one, but part two is that there's such a drought of, of an 80s old school. There, there's like a, a vintage Silver Age old school and a Kirby, but, but nobody's doing what we grew up with. Uh, if you're like in a 30 to 25 year old demographic, it's like, man, nobody's revamping our childhood. So uh, a lot of stuff now is really uh, rendered, overly rendered, um, dark, gritty, like I said before. So I wanted to kind of be the, 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 the contrast to that, kind of be a contrarian and say, look at, all, look at all these preschool colors I got and, you know, stuff like that. So now, not to be confused, though, I watch a lot of gritty, grimy TV. I just don't let it affect my artwork. but. Shows like The Shield, The Wire, I love stuff like that. I'm on Facebook, like everybody is nowadays, and uh, I, the promoter of the show, a gentleman named Ken Murphy, contacted me and asked me if I would come, and he uh, is a big Green Lantern fan, He'd seen my work, and, and asked me to design the t-shirt and the program, um, and to be a guest. So here I am. I've never been to Missouri before. This is terrific. We're really pleased with the growth that Cape Comic Con has had. Um, I think my, my goals would be to make it a regional show and not just a community-based show. We'd like for this show to reach six or seven states, um, 300 miles in every direction. And we'd like to grow this show to about 5,000 people. It may, take, it may take a few more years, but uh, again, with the growth that we've had, we're looking forward to making Cape Comic Con a real big event each year in the spring. In 1990, in Severn, Maryland, the daughter of a clergyman was discovered by a music industry insider while pumping gas at a service station. The odds of her getting signed and spending 11 weeks at number one on the U.S. singles charts? One in 19 million. The odds of this former church choir singer going on to sell 40 million records? One in 15 million. The odds of the same woman winning six Grammy Awards and starring in two Broadway plays? One in 75 million. The odds of this musician and performer having a child diagnosed with autism? One in 150. I'm Tony Braxton, and I encourage you to learn the signs of autism at AutismSpeaks.org. Early diagnosis can make a lifetime of difference. Academic Hall on the campus of Southeast Missouri State University is home to the Carillon Bells, a timeless treasure that rings out the time, and melodic tunes for the campus community. Lauren McNamara has our report. If you've ever walked across Southeast Missouri State University's campus, chances are you've heard the melodic chiming coming from Academic Hall in the center of campus. The source of the music is the Carillon Bells, which have been keeping students, faculty, and staff on time for classes and meetings for the past 48 years. Julie Gruneberg, Assistant Registrar for Graduation at Southeast, provides us with the history of the Southeast Carillon Bells. You know, if you had to pick one thing out of all of the history of the university, one thing that said to people, this is Southeast Missouri State, it's the Dome and the Carillon. Despite rumors of the bells being donated by a church, it was actually Fred Nader, co-founder of the Southeast Missouri newspaper, who donated the Carillon Bells to Southeast in 1962. The university graciously accepted his donation. Mr. Fred Nader had heard Carillon Bells throughout the United States. He was particularly interested in the bells of a church that he heard in Miami. So um, February of 1962, he contacted Schulmerich Carillons out of uh, Pennsylvania, 
who was the supplier of the Carillon for the church in Miami, and inquired about what it would cost, what it would take to get a Carillon at the State College here in Cape Girardeau, because that's what we were at the time. Um, he learned that it would be a little over $12,000, and he approached the university president at that time, Dr. Mark Scully, and uh, they worked out an agreement whereby Mr. Nader would donate the entire amount to purchase a carillon and four scrolls. As time went on, Southeast purchased more scrolls, and the bells became a trademark on campus. But one would be shocked by the simplicity of the mechanism that creates such harmonic sounds. The carillon itself would completely surprise anyone who wasn't familiar with it. You know, you hear the bells and you expect some huge, monstrous, you know, grand piano. But in fact, it's a metal cabinet that's not much larger than a file cabinet. It has a door that opens and that's where the player piano type scroll is installed. And it, you know, change it whenever you need to. At the top of it, there's a clock face and around the face of that clock there are little slots and there are two kinds of metal keys that can be placed into those slots. Uh, one causes the Westminster chimes to play on the quarter hour and one causes music to play. If you stand right next to the carillon itself where the music is playing, you will strain to hear that music. It's those amplifiers that make it sound so loud. Um, from the research I've done in the archives, those amplifiers cause the sound from that little metal box to be amplified over 10,000 times. And that's why you hear it so loud across campus. Our carillon has 50 different bells, 25 of them are harp tuned. There's a little tiny metal tooth that's about half the size of a toothpick. And that is what is actually creating the sound. Unfortunately, this type of carillon is a dying art. Southeast is one of the few institutions in the United States that still has a scroll playing carillon, thanks to the campus's facilities management. They, along with the help of Julie Gruneberg for the past few years, have been responsible for the care and upkeep of the fragile bells since their installation. Schulmerich no longer um, provides the uh, scrolls for uh, a machine that this, that's this old and I don't think they've made those kinds of carillons in quite a number of years. So uh, whatever's left, I would say we're much in the minority as compared to other schools. Julie explains just how delicate the instrument can be. With any, any paper, um, keeping it dust free is very important and each scroll comes in its own box. Um, so it's all the dust and dirt is kept out that way. Occasionally, as they're moving through the moving parts of the carillon, um, they can be popped, that is the paper just separates, and then the scroll can no longer be used. So um, at last count, I think we had about seven or eight scrolls that were still usable. While the bells chime every 15 minutes, the music plays only three times a day music plays three times a day at 7.55 a.m., at 11.55 a.m., and at uh, 3.55 p.m. So whatever scroll, whatever song is next on the scroll, that's what plays. The Carillon Bells certainly run deep in the tradition of Southeast Missouri State University, but it is significant to the Cape Girardeau community as well. I think that for the most part, the community enjoys it every bit as much as anyone on the campus does. They live by the sound of the Westminster chimes. I honestly think that even with the occasional aggravation from it, that most of the people in the area would be lost without the carillon. It's obvious that the bells serve as more than just a clock for Southeast and the surrounding community. I think it's a tradition that is just incredible. And unfortunately, it is a tradition that will someday be gone because eventually, we won't have any scrolls left and we won't have a carillon anymore. It will be a quiet day on the Southeast Missouri State University campus after the carillon plays its last song. At Southeast Missouri Hospital, we deliver nearly twice as many babies as any place else in Cape. That means Maggie was born without a care in the world. 
We were the first in the area to establish a neonatal intensive care unit. That means Nick and his dad are already having their man-to-man -man talks. We're the region's first and only hospital to achieve national magnet recognition for excellence in nursing. That means Patrick and Peggy are used to the royal treatment. Why do the people of Southeast Missouri Hospital work so hard to be leaders in childbirth? Because of what it means to the people who come from outside our hospital. In 2009, we achieved our second Health Grades Outstanding Patient Experience Award and ranked in the top 10% nationally. That means Carly and her mom are feeling very comfortable in the world. Visit Southeast Missouri Hospital on the web or call our health line. See what makes us the region's most trusted source for childbirth care. After two years of planning, Cape Splash, the new Cape Girardeau water park, is already a big hit in this region. It has a variety of rides, slides, and pools. Something for everyone. Summer in Cape Girardeau kicked off with a splash, literally. On Memorial Day weekend, Cape Splash Water Park, the city's newest attraction, opened its gates and people rushed in in waves. Cape Girardeau Park and Recreation's Associate Director, Penny Williams, has been involved with the water park since it was just an idea. And she tells us about the process of making that idea a reality. The Cape Girardeau Parks and Recreation Department is so excited about bringing the Cape Splash Water Park um, into the community. It is a um, recreational venue that has something for everyone. The water park, which is open seven days a week from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m., was made possible by a grant Cape Girardeau received for improvements and additions to its Park and Recreations Department. This is part of a Parks and Recreation Stormwater Initiative and it's one of 10 projects that we hope to complete in the next 10 years. Um, the water park has been something that the residents of Cape Girardeau have asked for for a long time. So we've always, the Parks and Recreation Department has always had it first and foremost um, in their minds as a venue that we know the residents of this community and the surrounding area would enjoy. In order to make Cape Splash a venue everyone would love, the Parks and Recreations Department invited townspeople to share their ideas on what the water park should include. You know, we met for probably two years prior, and we always had ideas, and everybody had special features that they wanted to include. We solicited information from a lot of groups as to what they would like to see in the water park, and then, of course, the Parks and Recreation Department had ideas of their own. After they finalized the blueprint, construction of Cape Splash began, and the long process of ideas and planning was finally becoming a reality. Um, it started shortly after Labor Day weekend, um, but it's come together quite quickly. I'm a very visual person, so I can look at plans somewhat, but to actually see this place um, erected now is so exciting. And, and I really do think that we have done a great job in um, making this something that every, there's gonna be something here for everybody. And that's been our goal. There's no doubt about that. Penny tells us about all the great amenities Cape Splash has to offer. The Cape Splash Water Park sets on 3.5 acres. Um, it has a bath house that is um, completely ADA accessible. We'll have picnic tables and um, that are all ADA accessible also. Um, you will see we have a splash pad area that'll have a soft surface that'll be for the toddlers. We have another area that has zero depth entry that has a small playground feature that has slides and it's a very interactive type playground. Um, there's a vortex pool. That's a, another name for a swirl pool. Uh, there's six lanes, lap lanes, that has a, a smaller slide section to it. And then of course we have a big set of slides that you can kind of see behind me and um, a 700 foot lazy river. There really is something here for everyone. With so many fun features, it's hard to say what will be the crowd favorite. 
it depends on what size you are really as to what's going to excite you. If you're a little guy, it might be the dragon in the splash pad, you know, or um, if you're a little bit older, it might, you might be amazed by the fact that our vortex pool will actually push you along in a circle, you and your group of friends. But really, I think what's going to be a neat feature about um, the Cape Splash Water Park is the waterfall that flows over into the Lazy River, but nothing's going to surpass the big slides that set up on the hill right there. The visual that you'll be able to see out over um, Osage Park will be one that'll be unforgettable. The experience in general at Cape Splash will be unforgettable. The park will be a hot spot not only for Cape Girardeau citizens, but for people throughout the region. It's going to be a big draw, I think, for this community. People have been calling from all over wanting to make reservations for private parties and for group rates and things. So I really think that this water park is going to bring people from all over the area to Cape Girardeau, which means they will eat in restaurants, they'll stay in hotels, they'll buy gas here, which is just all the better for us. Cape Splash should cause a big boost for Cape Girardeau by attracting people to the area and providing numerous new jobs. You know, at any one given time, there'll be 25, eight, 18 lifeguards actually, and 25 total um, employees that will be on site at this particular facility. So we, of course, will employ lifeguards, cashiers, concession workers, um, maintenance personnel. So, um, you know, it, it, we have hired probably 50 additional employees to our staff that we don't normally recruit in the summertime. In addition to the slides, splash pad, lap pool and lazy river, Cape Splash offers swimming lessons and birthday and private party reservations as well. So this summer, don't let the heat get to you. Cool off at Cape Splash. Take my hand and start a brand new day. Underneath everything we are, we are all people. And when we reach out a hand to one, we can influence the condition of all. That's what it means to live united. Southeast Missouri Hospital is the only hospital in the region to be named a Blue Distinction Center for cardiac care by Blue Cross and Blue Shield. That means we got to spend our 30th anniversary together. And we're looking forward to our 40th. We achieved the Health Grid Specialty Excellence Award in Cardiac Surgery. That means I'll be here to meet my first grandbaby. Southeast achieved a five-star rating from Health Grades for coronary bypass surgery. That means a lot more birthdays with our kids and our grandkids, too. Why do the people of Southeast Missouri Hospital work so hard to be leaders in cardiac surgery? Because of what it means to the people who come from outside our hospital. Visit Southeast Missouri Hospital on the web or call our health line. Understand your risks for heart disease and see what makes us the region's most trusted source for cardiac surgery. What once started in an auction barn is now a thriving house of worship. Jim Matthews is the pastor of the Cape County Cowboy Church. We're a cowboy church and everybody that comes here sure isn't a cowboy and don't have to be one to come here. But basically what we are, we're a church that reaches a group of people that, uh, that really love and, and long for more or less that cowboy way of life, even though some of them never owned a horse, never want to, but there's some basic things about that that uh, it's usually more of a, a rural type lifestyle. But we kind of targeted that group whenever we started this church back in 04 and trying to reach uh, that segment of, of society. And uh, so that's where we started from. And, and uh, you know, we worship the same Jesus. We uh, sing with the great old hymns that have been around for forever, a lot of the new ones that, but we try to do each of those in a way uh, that, that appeals to those. It's my, you know, mo most of our singing's more of a, I always say it sounds like they stepped out of a bar full of Jesus, more of a, a country band style. Uh, if 
you if you interview most of our people, they would they would typically listen to country western radio stations. So as we worship, as we sing, we try to do it in such a way as that. It's more that that culture of people that we are and that we seek above all, above others to reach and do it in such a way that communicates with them. And, uh, we don't, don't use a lot of church language and, uh, and, and et cetera. And it's, it's, it's godly language, but it's not necessarily the, the religious language of praise the Lord's and hallelujahs all along and nothing wrong if somebody does that. Man, we love the cross. We love the fish symbols. We love pictures of Jesus. Not a thing wrong with that. But one of the things we try to do, there's no statement that says, and all things spiritual be natural, and all things natural be spiritual. So sometimes we want to take some of the churchiness out of our facilities, especially to seek those that are non-believers so when they walk in, they don't just get slapped in the face of a of religion that, that they're a little foreign to, not comfortable with yet, and especially the Christ of our, of our faith. So what we've chosen to do is uh, we'll take a wonderful uh, picture that they can relate to that will draw them to something they're familiar with and then underneath it we'll write something how we're to bear one another's burdens and so it takes a, a natural event in their life and puts a spiritual twist to it that, that's subtle enough but yet drives a message home from there. Of course, we started out in a barn and it really, we were all comfortable there. You didn't have to clean up to go. If your boots had mud and other kind of cow stuff on it, it really didn't matter. It served us well for five years, but just simply we outgrew it. And because of pure size sake, we had to, to leave it and we've uh, um, put together a building that will house us now. What we like about this location, first of all, it gives us room. Typically on a Sunday morning, we'll run somewhere between 1,100 and 1,200 people. And where we were before, we had a, we could seat 419 people if they were all skinny. We had to have two services, and, and so now we can all come. We can worship in one place. We've got uh, um, where we rented that. We were able to use it uh, one night and a few hours on a Sunday morning. Here we use it day in and day out. Uh, a lot of different activities that we're able to do, whether it be Bible studies or, or other events that, that we're able to use it from that standpoint. Everybody was so comfortable with the old barn. I mean, they weren't threatened by it. We felt at home in it. And we wanted that same atmosphere as we came here. And so with that, we've, uh, uh, like in this room, this is old walnut, 22 years old, that's been sitting in a barn that we just put rough cut walnut up. Uh, down below, as you saw, the worship centers, those are hand-hewed logs that, that they, uh, we took out of old barns that we tore down and, and did that with a lot of stonework, uh, the, the old chuck wagon that's there, all of that just to give that feel uh, for the culture that we're, we're used to. You know, for us, padded pews, nothing wrong with them, but for us, it's just we're more comfortable like it is here. Uh, you know, carpeted floors, nothing wrong with them, but we love concrete. Uh, and like I said, we can just uh, be at home like this. We've got a lot of young couples, a lot of youth, we've got a lot of senior saints. We've just got a lot of people from every age bracket and from a lot of different walks of life. I mean, we've got factory workers and farmers, doctors and lawyers and teachers and judges and the list goes on. And so it's a pretty good gamut, but there's usually a common thread amongst us. It's a love of this culture, but most importantly, it grows into a love for our Jesus. Well, I like the Cowboy Church because I, I really like the music. My grandparents started um, it invited me to go here. The greatest thing that we found is just, first of all, our God. You know, it's kind of interesting. The horse and the connection to the horse or maybe the uniqueness of the title of our church, Cowboy Church, or that we met in an auction barn. Many times, that was kind of the hook that drew people in. But what we found out is they come the first time for maybe something like that that's a little unique or something that's a, a kinship. But what keeps them is the Spirit of God. In 1977 in Johannesburg, South Africa, an eight-year-old boy picked up the game of golf from his father. By the age of nine, he was already out playing him. The odds of this gentle lad winning the Junior World Golf Championships at the age of 14 one in 16 million. The odds of that same boy then making it to the US and European pro golf tours, one in seven million. The odds of the Big Easy winning the Open Championship once and the US Open Championship twice, one in 780 million.
The odds of this professional golfer having a child diagnosed with autism? One in 150. Ernie Else encourages you to learn the signs of autism at autismspeaks.org. Early diagnosis can make a lifetime of difference. Each month, we will take this journey where there are many places to go. There are many interesting people to meet and so many new things to see. Join us again on River Tales.